Hello again and welcome to Down My Books, the book review channel where we add insight into the worlds of literature, both for those who do read and those who don't. Today I venture back to a very famous Japanese author whose book Kafka on the Shore I hated to love, but will this earlier work be any different? Well, let's find out. Today I review the Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. Those who don't know, Haruki Murakami is a highly successful Japanese author whose books have been translated into countless languages. When I made it my mission to start reading more, Murakami's name popped up just about everywhere, from commenters on this channel to fellow readers and even other book reviewers. I must admit that my first foray into his work left me rather frustrated for Murakami likes to leave bread trails throughout his novels and it is often on the reader to solve them. This style of writing is not usually to my liking, not in the slightest, however, having finished Kafka on the Shore, the book I'd read before this one, I knew almost immediately that I would not be done with Murakami so easily, for there is something rather beautiful in his style of writing, and although I didn't get the satisfaction of a clear-cut ending, I was still left with the feeling of having lived in another world, where things happened by a wonderful and magical chance. If anything, it showed both the magic of small events and the strangeness of connectivity. The Wind Up Bird Chronicle is nothing different to that sense of wonder I've mentioned. It throws you into a world that at first feels a lot like your own, however as time passes you learn of its intimate nature and of its heavy focus on cause and effect. This book almost plays out like a dream, but has the depth and seriousness to avoid being otherworldly or nonsensical. It walks the fine line between reality and fantasy, and leaves you with a wondrous fascination to the world around you, and in some ways, an appreciation for the smaller quirks of living. The story focuses on central character Toru Okada, who is a man in his early 30s living at home with his wife Kamiko. Toru has recently left his law job in the pursuit of something more, though in that present moment he doesn't know exactly what that is, or indeed what it is he's looking for precisely. The start of the tale sees him on a quest to find his missing cat, and from there events tumble one after the other. You meet many characters in this book, perhaps too many for me to mention in this review alone, but each having something very special and endearing about them. On the search for his cat, Toru meets a young girl called Mei Kasahara whilst looking down a sealed off alley at the back of his house. As he wanders down this alley, he notices an old abandoned house and feels an immediate fascination to it. Mei Kasahara watches him with intrigue and they later begin a series of conversations, each being as weird as it is wonderful. Back home, Toru's wife Kamiko feels disconnected and stays out late in the evening, although Toru thinks little of it. On the phone, a woman calls to talk about things no child would wish to hear, and in the pursuit of their missing cat, Toru's wife Kamiko hires a mysterious woman called Malta Kano, who has an ability to foresee certain future events. It's a lot to unpack in this review, and partly because this book was originally published as three separate pieces when released in Japan. You later meet a devious character called Noboru Watea, who is the brother of Kamiko, and you can't help but feel a distrust and disdain for his way of being. He's described as a genius, although one who wears a thick, almost impenetrable mask. Tolu can see through this, however, the waking world is not as wise. Kimiko later disappears, and Toru does not accept the claims of Noboru Watea, who seems to be pulling at every string around them. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to overview the story any more than that, because it is long and many, many things happen. Murakami tells a multitude of tales throughout this book that are very well written and do come together at the end. However, certain relevances are not revealed and are left to the interpretation of the reader, which to my surprise did not annoy me. You see, this book does differ to that of Kafka on the shore, in the sense that the author does answer questions regarding the world he has created, and does solve select mysteries with certainty. This left me far less conflicted at the book's close. What does stay the same in this work, in fact what is done to greater effect, is the definition of the characters and their relationships. Murakami really adds life and fire to these individuals and defines them in precise and minute detail. 
you learn much about who, where and when and are transported to different places and events throughout the 20th century. Minor characters are explored in depth and darker tales of wartime are layered throughout. These serve to enhance the central narrative and increase your connection to the main plot and to the lives of the characters. It works well very well. I left this book with my head in a completely different place. It was a world that was just as bizarre as it was beautiful, and I did feel a tinge of sorrow when I finished the last page. For the journey was over, as they say. This book does what author Murakami does best. It creates a fascinating world that is somewhat mirrored to our own. It's a place where little events all come together and where dull moments are rarely to be seen, where intriguing people meet one another and are entangled for a web of deeper meaning and circumstance. It strongly suggests answers to its own riddles, but still leaves sections open for interpretation. Plenty enough to make this a very fascinating book, even when you finish the final page. I do have my gripes of this work, and this may be because the one book I have read, the English translation, was originally released in Japan as three, something I did not know until writing this review, although it should have appeared obvious as it was split into three. Nonetheless, my gripe comes in the final third. The start of this section felt a little lost in comparison to others. It practically drops multiple characters from the main narrative, and this was a bit jarring. They do pop up here and there, but they are suddenly replaced with new people, and for a book with a host of characters already, I'm not entirely sure it was necessary. However, Murakami does manage to make this work, and the new characters introduced do have an alert to them, but it, it just felt a little sudden to me, and at around the 400 page mark, my interest was flaking. However, this is a minor critique, as the story does gather pace again, and later resolves in a satisfying manner. The characters that I felt were dropped are spoken of again and do loosely make their way back into the tale. And so maybe I'm getting more accustomed to the style of Murakami's writing, for I certainly enjoyed this book much more than the last I had read. It did leave me feeling rather sad as I finished it, however it also left me positively excited for the books to come. With this in mind, I would score this novel a 89 out of 100 and I would certainly recommend it to anyone for it creates an enchanting world of mystique and fantasy, and one that must be read rather than seen, and it is for this reason I have not gone so deeply into the plot. However, maybe in a future video we can discuss that together. My friends, thank you very much for watching. Should you wish to buy this book, there will be a little affiliate link below, and I will see you here again soon for some more book discussion and reviews. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.